Good morning. I will be the moderator for the class. Today is January 2nd, 2024. Uh, class, you have been muted. Please continue to monitor your mute and video buttons during class. Welcome to the Zoom class given by some students of the Institute of Divine Metaphysical Research. We are a Zoom class of international honest hearted truth seekers of Yahshua the Messiah. This is a school and not a church, and neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non denominational religious and scientific research organization dedicated to showing proof of the existence of Yahweh, our Elohim, and the operation of his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. This school was established as the result of a divine vision and divine revelation given to the founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. This school was incorporated in the state of California in the year 1958. Classes are held in Canada, United States, Jamaica, England, and Zambia, with students studying in the Bahamas, Ghana, Malaysia, Australia, and certain other foreign countries. The host is Dr. Lenore Allen of Brooklyn, New York. And today, our facilitator is Dr. Dennis Pratt of Fairmont, West Virginia. In this school, we teach the true, correct, and original name and title of the Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name of the Heavenly Father is Yahweh. Yahweh has been improperly substituted with the title Lord. The true title of the Word or Son is Elohim. Elohim has been improperly substituted with the title God. The name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. Yahshua has been erroneously substituted with Jesus Christ. Lord and God are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 verse 5 that there are lords and gods many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. That means that Elohim is a title that our creator Yahweh chose for himself. Jesus is a name, but it is an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part in a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that neither the Hebrew language the Greek language nor the Latin language have any characters or letters in their alphabet that would produce the sound that is made by this letter J. Neither was there a J in the English alphabet until some 1400 years after the Messiah's death. Therefore, such names as Jesus and Jehovah are impossible renderings of the true and original name of our Father and his Son. Christ is a title, just like Lord and God. Yahweh is pure spirit, and in his pure spirit state, he is incomprehensible, inscrutable, and indiscernible. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh in his pure spirit state, symbolized on this Moses chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape or form. We have drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on this chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive of him in his pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself as Elohim. This is the word or son, a super incorporeal being, that is, having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form can only be seen in divine visions 
and understood in divine revelation. Later on, the self-same spirit manifested himself in a physical body and walked the earth plane as Yahshua the Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. Now, there is only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name. So the simple yet intelligent question that we should ask ourselves is, what was the name of the Savior during the time he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of this name, Yahshua, and title, Elohim, may be had by reading the preface of the Holy Name Bible. Also in this school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It is called the divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he called Moses atop Mount Sinai and showed him the tabernacle pattern in a vision. Yahweh instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. The pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court round about. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. In this school, we show proof that everything in the universe is made and operates according to the structure and function of this divine threefold tabernacle pattern and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. In this class, we teach the mission of Yahshua the Messiah which was to fulfill the old covenant and to write the new covenant in our heart and mind by the preaching of the gospel. The 10 primary aims and objectives are as follows. First, to help you find and know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and actually exists. Second, to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah, without distinction of race or nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third, to investigate the unexplained spirit law, or so-called law of nature, and the powers latent in man. Fourth, to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, and modern practical and occult science. Fifth, to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Six, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seven, to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons, operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eighth, to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth, to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained there is no other name given among men whereby man can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And tenth, to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace and our slogan is speak the truth. This morning, we will begin with a prayer by Dr. Edna Mixon. We will have a song by Dr. Jackie McCain. Our scripture lesson is Acts, the second chapter, to be read by Dr. Deborah Van Hook. And our readers today will be Dr. Jackie McCain and Dr. Deborah Van Hook. May we have our prayer, Dr. Mixon? Uh, yes, good morning. Good day to everyone. Uh, let us bow our heart and minds for a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, Yahweh. We want to thank you ever so much for allowing us to be able to come to these classes and sit down and learn all we can while we can, because we have been told we're going to need it. Thank you for waking us up to the reality 
of all the things that are taking place. We want to ask that you continue to hold on to us and all that we don't understand or the things we may not even be sure of. We ask that you open up our understanding to the things that we truly need to know. We all know that we don't have to know a whole bunch, but what we do know, know for sure. We want to thank you for loving us and just hold on to us. And I want to say with these blessings, all honor, all glory, all the praises go to you. May we all say hallelujah. 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 Hebrews 10 and 22 states, let us draw near with a true heart in Wait. full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure blood. Blessed assurance, Yahshua is mine. Oh, what a fortress of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of Yah, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising Yahshua all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising Yahshua all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of Yahshua to give us light. Angels descending, bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking at Yah, filled with his mercy, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising Yahshua all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising Yahshua all the day long. Praise Yahshua. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Gave me chills. Good job. Hallelujah. Beautiful. Good morning, brethren. I'll be reading Acts second chapter. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, while they were all with one accord in one space, one place, suddenly there came the sound of, from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire and rested upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. And as the Spirit gave them utterance, and they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now, when they were 
this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and they were confused. They were confounded that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own language, wherein we were born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea, in Cappadocia, in Pontus, and Asia, Vigeria, and Pamphylia, Pamphylia in Egypt, and in parts of Libya about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jew, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our language, in our tongues, the wonderful works of Elohim. And they were all amazed and were in doubt saying one to another, what meaneth this? Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine and are drunken. But Peter standing up with the 11, lifted up his voice and said unto them, ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my my words, for these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is of that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith Yahweh, will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaids, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and terrible day of Yahweh come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of Yahweh shall be saved. Ye men, sons of Israel, hear these words. Yahshua of Nazareth, a man of food of Yahweh, among you by miracles and wonders and signs which Yahweh did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsels and foreknowledge of Yahweh, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom Yahweh have raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David spoke, excuse me, for David speaketh concerning him. I have set Yahweh always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Was glad moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope. Because of thou will not leave my soul in shield. Neither will thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me speak freely unto you of the patriarch 
patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulch in and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that Yahweh had sworn unto with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would, would rise, he would raise up the Messiah to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of the Messiah, that his soul was not left in Sheol, neither did his flesh see corruption. This Yahshua the Messiah, excuse me, this Yahshua hath Yahweh raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of Yahweh exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended unto the heavens, but he saith himself, Yahweh said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foe footstool my fo thy foes, thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that Yahweh hath made that same Yahshua, whom ye have crucified, both King and Messiah. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Yahshua the Messiah, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as far as excuse me, even as many as Yash, Yahweh, our Elohim, shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this perverse generation. Then they that gladly received his words were baptized, and the same clave there where, excuse me, were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and all had <clears throat> excuse me, and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man <clears throat> had need. And they continued, and they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from, from house to house did eat their food with gladness and singleness of heart, praising Yahweh and having favor with all the people. And Yahweh added to the congregation daily, such as were being saved. I've read to you Acts, the second chapter. Hallelujah. 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 We thank everyone for their participation. I will now turn this class over to our host, Dr. Dennis Pratt. Good day, family. It is definitely a day that Yahweh has made for us to grow in him as it was shared in the prayer, a beautiful prayer, to continue the increase of his knowledge and his power so that we may impart that to those who are still being called unto himself. 
as it says here in verse in verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And we're, we know it's ba a baptism of his gospel in the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So I'm thankful that we have a day today to see Yahshua in his glory. He's called us by name and given us a heart to be here. I hope uh, this broadcast will also reach those who are first-time visitors, returning visitors, as well as those who are here assembled online. I would like to start the class with at least 40 minutes of someone that's going to be called to lay the foundation and introduce the name and the pattern and the institution fulfillment that we have been given the opportunity to learn of and to see the proof according to a divine vision revelation that was given to one Dr. Henry Clifford Kenley in the year 1931. So at this time, I'm going to ask for Dr. Federio Warren from Michigan, Detroit, Michigan, please, to be our first speaker. Uh, timer can be set for 40 to 50 minutes to introduce this gospel to first time and returning visitors. And after that first speaker has has labored in love, which I'm sure he will to to do to to perform that which was given to us, we will begin the second reading. We will continue with the second reading that's found in volume two on page twenty two in our school textbook. Dr. Dar the Daryl Warren. Is he not available? I see that he's online. He's still muted. So I don't know if you need to unmute Dr. Warren. Okay, then I'd like to ask Dr. Gene Burroughs, please, to be our first speaker to share with us the introduction of our father's name his divine title, and the true name of the Holy Spirit. Um, good day, everyone. And I hope that I can uh, stay connected. I'm having issues again with my connection. Um, I missed the... I missed the introduction of the um, person, uh, the visitor, because my tablet shut off and I just got back on. So, um, so Dr. Burris, we're basically laying a foundation for anyone that may view this broadcast or that's present in class as a first time or returning visitor. Okay, thank you. Uh, and again, good day. Good day. Good day. Good day. Welcome anyone that has not had the opportunity to hear about our wonderful creator, whose name is Yahweh Elohim. Yahweh is the father of all things, the creator of all things through his son. His name is Yahweh. He is the spirit that breathes within each one of us. When we take our first breath, the first thing we do is that Yahweh is spirit 
the substance he cannot see, seen, felt, and touched, as was explained in the moderation. Yeah is the male portion of his name, and way is the female portion of his name, which covers us all, all creatures. Uh, we spell, we don't speak in, in Hebrew, and I'm not um, one that is able to explain Hebrew language, but in order for us to be able to speak his name, the A was inserted between the Y and the H as uh, showing the first male that was made to walk on the earth, and that was Adam. The E in the name, which is pronounced way, is to explain Eve, the female portion of Yahweh, because Yahweh is both male and female. He is everything. Um, there, he, he, he is a unity. So many of us have been misled by being taught that he was or is a trinity, which would mean that he would be three separate pieces put together or three separate individualized persons put together. But yeah, Yahweh is a unity. First of all, he is the spirit that gave his son Elohim, which um is the super incorporeal form of him that he showed to Moses on the Mount of Sinai. And uh, we can see him on this Moses chart. I can't see the top of it on my tablet right now, but uh, he is, he, I beg your pardon. Can anyone hear me? Hello. Yes, I, yes, we can hear you. But oh, Doctor Burris is speaking right now. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, my mic wasn't working. I had to play around with this thing. I apologize. Okay, I won't be much longer anyway to Daryl, so you can pick up where I, okay. I stopped. I'm sorry, Dave. I didn't do that on purpose. I, I had to play around with this thing. Okay, thanks. I understand, and I'm still trying to explain that. I, I'm sorry I, I, I messed you up, Jean. My bad. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, 
no apology required. Uh, I'm not going to be able to keep up much longer, Dr. Pratt. But I wanted to say that Elohim is the super incorporeal form of Yahweh that actually was given the assignment by Yahweh to be the creator of everything in man's universe. And then the third portion of Yahweh Elohim is the physical man that was allowed to walk upon the earth plane. He was the one that was manifested in the creation for our salvation. <laughs> the Dario, can you pick up from this point? Hello. Can, can you guys hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, like I said, I apologize last time. I uh, I had to, uh, my mic was off internally, so I fixed the problem myself. But nevertheless, I'm glad to be here, and I'm glad to be able to give a reasonable testimony of um, Yahshua Messiah. And forgive me, because I was away from um, my my uh, desk for a little while. Now, what are we doing right now? Um, I, I I heard I was hearing your words, but I didn't understand them. Now, 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 how are we? T what, what are we working with right now? What what we're doing is we're introducing the teaching to. Okay, okay, I understand. Okay, I understand. Yeah. I, I attempted to start with the name. Okay. We have new listeners today. Yes. Okay. New I, I, okay. Forgive me for my um interruptions and all that. Okay. Yes. Yahweh, Elohim, and Yahshua is one name, and he is the true creator. And he proves that through science in the scriptures. Now, everything in the universe is threefold because he's threefold and we have to rightly divide the word of truth. You can, in other words, you cannot split Yahweh. You have to divide Yahweh. Now, the world is saying that Yahweh is a trinity. Or well, most people say that Yahweh is a trinity. That's wrong. Thinking like that can bring great destruction at a wholesale level and fire upon you with that, with that erroneous thought. And he shows that through the Adam. Because Adam are basically, you see, Protron, neutron, and electron is what an atom is. The protron and the neutron is in the most holy place because that's where our soul and spirit is, is within us. The electron stands for the outer man. The electron is the outer man. That's why it goes round about this, um, the atom. But now scientists are saying it doesn't go round and about. It goes uh, randomly. But I'm going to stick with that round and about because they're changing everything. In other words, what I'm saying, this whole creation, Yahweh created to point to him. 
and atoms are made of everything. And they're threefold except the hydrogen atom, which is twofold. And the reason why that's twofold is he's showing the spiritual creation and he's showing the physical creation right within himself. But right now, I'd just like to talk about the threefold atom because that proves that he is a unity and not a trinity. Now, when that first bomb, when they bombed Japan with the atom bomb, with that atomic bomb, the code word for that was trinity by that guy Oppenheimer. Yeah, he named it Trinity. If, if if you you know, in other words, Yahweh is showing us the destruction and the hell fire to come if we uh if his uh people don't get this right because they're saying that he's a trinity and he is not a trinity, he is a unity. Now, would you take me back to the atom? Because it can be proven by the atom because everything is made up of atoms. The, the, whole, the whole, I won't say the universe because scientists are saying that the universe is nothing but one big atom. That's how they're describing it now. They're saying that the universe is nothing but one big atom, but they don't take an account for the angels because I don't know if I, the angels are spirit. But scientists are saying that the whole creation is nothing but atoms because you got your periodic chart and all the atoms on that periodic chart is threefold. Now I'm using science because science uh, reflects our creator because he created everything. So it, like I said, in the atom you have the, the proton, the neutron, and the electron. The proton has a positive charge and the neutron has a negative charge. I'm sorry, the electron has a negative charge. I'm sorry. This is proven that Yahweh is threefold. And when you split the atom, now you can split an atom. That's how they made the atomic bomb by splitting an atom. And when you split an atom, you have to split it at this neutron. And when you split the atom, it becomes two atoms. But it does not weigh the same. In other words, if you split, I'm used, I know an atom don't weigh, weigh 10 pounds, but I'll just say 10 pounds. If you split an atom, you get two atoms, but instead of those two atoms weighing 10 pounds, those two pounds are now eight pounds because you lost two pounds by uh, splitting that atom, which turns into energy. Because Yahweh is energy also. He did energy points up to Yahweh, just like the atom point up to Yahweh, which is threefold. And when uh, they detonated that bomb in New Mexico, I believe it was, to test it, they called it, he called the secret name of a trinity, which shows you the destruction that can come with you splitting Yahweh. Because that atomic bomb was detonated in Hiroshima in Nagasaki, I believe it was, which caused widespread destruction and it caught, and when you detonate an uh, atomic bomb, if you look that right at it, it'll blind you because of the light. It's, remember, I'm saying it's pointing up to Elohim now because Elohim is the, the light. 
And when they detonated that bomb, a light was so bright that you couldn't even look at it. Because if you looked at it, it would blind you. And then after the bright light, you got a dark cloud. Mm -hmm. You get a dark cloud. We're showing you that Yahweh is in that cloud. As I said, everything points up to Yahweh, including science. Science is an image of our uh, creator. Can I have that? Would you stay on that, Adam, please? Because I'm not going to be long. Would you stay on the Adam? Because all things surround the tabernacle, physics also. And, and, and it shows it in the Adam. But you have to have a heavy uh, um, uh, what I'm telling you, you have to have an atom that contains lots of protons and neutrons. Now, not all atoms contain the same. Although the atoms contain a proton and a neutron and electron, but some atoms contain more than others. That's why you have to have a heavy element like plutonium to make a, a, a enriched plutonium to make a to make an atomic bomb because that's short. In other words, this is what I'm trying to say. Yahweh does everything for a reason. They call this age the atomic age. And by splitting that atom and the cold main being he, Yahweh is showing us through science how dangerous it is to split the unity of the spirit just by that atomic bomb. Yahweh don't kill up a lot of people for nothing. He, he did that to show us how dangerous it is to call him a trinity. He is not a trinity. He is a, a unity. But by the same atom, if you divide it properly, it can heat your home. It can cook your food for you. It can be beneficial to the same atom because we know that Elohim is the first atom now that was created. He truly is Elohim. He's the first man Adam. But this is what happens. Uh, give me that scripture when it says rightly dividing the word, word of truth. They don't rightly divide the word of truth. What they're doing is splitting the word of truth. They're saying that he's three separate entities. He is not three separate entities. He's one Yahweh and three different manifestations. Second Timothy, Second Timothy uh, two fifteen. Okay, will someone read that? Study to show thyself approved unto Yahweh, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's Second mm -hmm. Timothy two fifteen. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. He is that word of truth. And if you rightly divide the word of truth, it'll be beneficial to you. Just like that, Adam can be beneficial to you if you, if you divide it rightly. But if you split it, it brings wholesale destruction and fire upon people. That's what Yahweh was trying to show by them detonating those bombs over there in Japan. He did not do that to be cruel to his uh, creatures. He, he, Yahweh prefer us to suffer for a little while because it's better than suffering throughout eternity. So he wants us to suffer a little while because he's showing us He's showing us things because it's better to suffer now than go out to go out through eternity to suffer. He that's why that atomic bomb, believe it or not, all, Yahweh is awesome. 
he's he's loving, but uh, he'll get with you too. And he does all these things to bring us to a knowledge of him. Yes, including killing people. I mean, that's how, I mean, he's the creator. You know, it sounds cruel, but he ain't like no Jesus. You know, he owns the creation and he can do what he will to do with his creation. But I figure I'll put some science in our diet because, you know, he's science also. He's more than these scriptures now. Because as I said, the creation, everything happens in the creation is a reflection of Yahweh and his purpose. And that's why that atomic bomb was created to show us the danger and uh, splitting the Godhead. Because as I said, everything is made up of Adam. That points to everything is made up of Elohim because he's threefold and you cannot split him. You have to divide him. When you split him, you bring in wholesale destruction upon yourself. Now, I, that's all I can, that's all I got right now because, you know, I, I'm a science guy. I, I like science. I like the scriptures too. But see, if you burn all the books, all the Bibles in the world, your human body and science will still point up to Elohim because Elohim is the creator of the universe and every and science points up to Elohim and, and those atoms point up to Ad Elohim. I'm going to say it again because all atoms are threefold. And Elohim is threefold. So he's proven his nature by those atoms because everything is made up of the atoms. And this is one way he's proven his existence by, believe it or not, by those atoms, by the atomic structures in Adam. I wish I could give you more, but, um, I can only give you a taste right now because I ha I would have to draw pictures and go around the different charts and whatnot. Without the chart, I'm kind of like, you know, I got my hands tied behind my back because I, 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 I preach off those charts. I can show you better on the charts. But hopefully you got something out of that. The reason why Yahweh had them... Um, create that atomic bomb. That was Yahweh behind that, doing that in this age to show us the danger of us splitting the Godhead. You cannot split. Uh, Adam means indivisible, which means you cannot split it. That's what an Adam means. You cannot split it. You can divide it, but you uh, uh you can divide the word or two, but do not split the word or two. Because if you split him, he's going to bring wholesale destruction and fire upon you. But if you divide him, get him right, he's going to give you eternal life. That same Adam that will kill you is the same Adam that will make your life better. You can cook with it. As I said, you can clean your clothes with it. It's the atomic, atomic age got lots of uh, things for people either way. It can be used negative or positive because that's what Elohim is. He's both negative and he's positive. And that shows it in the structure of atoms. I'm not looking at the um, periodic chart. I'm a like I said. I have to see pictures to 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 um to bring back my memory and all that because I'm I'm rusty at that. But I, I decided to use science instead of scripture to uh, prove our Elohim because as I said, science points up to Elohim. You can't get around it because He's the Creator of all things, and all things point up to act to 
to the first man, Adam, Elohim, and everything was created from the Adams. So everything is three, the Adams are threefold because Elohim is threefold. And as I said, the proton and the neutron is in the temple of the Adam, and the electron would be your body is on the outside of the of the um is on the new of the atom going around. And that's why atoms are made like that. Except the hydrogen atom, which shows for I'm I'm repeating them, which shows the angelic angelic creation and the physical creation. That's what that hydrogen out atom is showing. And with that, I, I, I say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, I'd like to thank our uh, speakers. I would just like to make a comment and I'd like it's the, the timer, the moderator to time me to 12.15 before we begin our, our continue our second reading. So for the first time and returning visitors, if the scripture readers can get for me John 5 and 39 and the second reading can get Exodus 24, 9 and 10, we would have nothing to say about this gospel had it not been for a divine vision revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kenley, as was stated in the moderation, and we see his name written in the upper right-hand corner of this chart. He explained that he was given a vision, which we come to find and prove how true it was and how true it is for the Holy Spirit to just take over a body and to explain and confirm the visions given to Moses and John the Revelator. So a man having a divine vision revelation is proven to us not to be foreign, but it is a part of his purpose because as we read in Acts, it is Pentecost that then provides that Holy Spirit to step in us and to show us and confirm this divine vision revelation that's in the scriptures. So we are taught how to begin reading the scriptures instead of what we were taught as far as opening the Bible and starting with Genesis or opening the Bible and letting it just fall where it falls and, and, and believing that, you know, so-called God that we didn't even know had a name is just telling us to begin here. So let's read John 5 and 39, please. He searched the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. So the scriptures, after being in class and, and, and hearing this gospel, is not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which they call the New Testament. But when this is spoken, and as it was said by a previous speaker, to rightly divide the word of truth, knowing what time frame this was taking place in. And our father drew out a chart that we coined the dispensation and ages chart. And this chart consists of seven ages and seven dispensations, which correlate to the seven days in our week, which starts to make sense why we have seven days in a week, because it's going by the divine calendar. It's going by the divine pattern. And this chart shows us that our creator has created seven ages, which I won't go into in, in specifically because I just want to introduce him and his purpose and his pattern to you so you can have something to take with you and do further study as it's instructed in 2 Timothy, to study, to show thyself approved, to see and be confident that our creator, his name is Yahweh, and that he is operating by purpose and by pattern. And he's going according to events, which are spoken in scripture. So when this is written, we're in the fourth age. John is speaking to us, being filled with the Holy Spirit, you know, is speaking to us by inspiration to show us where to begin understanding anything about our Savior. And he says, begin with Moses. Moses is, is in this third age called the post-Diluvian age, which means after the flood. And it's after the event with Abraham and Melchizedek. So we're looking at the fourth dispensation, which is an ordering of events. And in this event, we are all familiar with the Ten Commandment law that was given to the children of Israel. So let's go ahead and read in Exodus 24. 24 and 9. 
Then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. And they saw the Elohim of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand. Also, they saw Elohim and did eat and drink. So on this chart, we see this chart is entitled Elohim, who is the archetype, a word that I was, was introduced to here in class. And with further research, you'll find it means original. He is the archetype pattern of the universe. That means everything, if you've done any sewing in your life or you're familiar with a tailor or any of those experiences, they know that they follow a pattern in, in creating a pants, a blouse, a skirt. You know, there's a pattern that's laid out for them to follow. And so Moses is shown in a divine vision revelation that the, the, our Savior, who is Elohim in a supreme corporal state, is a pattern and operates by a pattern because he shows Moses this pattern and, and it's confirmed with John on the Isle of Patmos. He instructs Moses, someone can get 20, Exodus 25, 8 and 9 and 40. He instructs Moses to build this pattern in the wilderness of Sinai. This pattern is in everyone's Bible, bar none. Everyone knows that there's a tabernacle built here in the wilderness. And this pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court around about. So this is confidence right here to show us that there's a pattern, and this pattern and this tabernacle was constructed, given to Moses to construct, to erect, so that the Messiah, Elohim himself, would dwell among them, and to show us that he is ever-present with them. He is, you know, as a fiery cloud, you know, and he is uh, as a regular cloud, so you see, you know, in the scriptures, it talks about a pillar of fire by night to give them light in this wilderness and a pillar of cloud by day to lead them the way. So let's read that in Exodus 25, 8 and 9. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I showed thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all... <clears throat> The instruments thereof, even so shall, shall ye make it. Verse 40, please. Verse 40. And look that thou make them after their pattern, which was showed thee in the mount. So here we are seeing it right in our own Bible, where Moses is, is instructed to have it recorded that our creator who came from pure spirit which he uses a cloud to symbolize himself and that his name is yahweh which he introduced to moses at this burning bush and then shared with him through this divine vision that he is a pattern and in sharing with him how the creation came in he slowed it down for moses and showed him in six days the creation coming in and on the seventh day how he rested that that is the Sabbath of Yahweh. So we see this recorded in the book of Genesis. So we understand now that it's through this vision, when it says in the beginning, it's in the beginning of Moses' vision, that the events and the creation being created follows this pattern. Because we see here in this pictorial illustration how Elohim, as the moderation shared, is Yahweh, is Yahshua, there are three yet one. There's one embodiment, there's one spiritual embodiment, and he is manifesting himself in a superincorporeal state and then in a physical state where he was the adequate atonement, the only atonement adequate enough to, to, to remove our sin, to, to, for, for the cleansing, for the remission of our sin. But he first set this process up, this purpose, when he shared with Moses his name, and then from there share with him what he used to do, which was to come down to Egypt, declare his name to the Israelites and to the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. Pharaoh rejected his name. The Israelites followed the instructions given by putting blood on a lentil, two side posts different from a base, and taking a lamb out 
on the first month of months given to them in this calendar. Let us get Exodus uh, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And then the other scripture, we can get Exodus 13, verse 4. So we can understand that January is not the first month of the year. According to scripture, the first month of the year given to the Israelites is Abib, which correlates to April. And it shows us that in this first month, they are being delivered. There is a, 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 a resurrection of life. This is a principle that's in this tabernacle pattern. So let's get that read, please. Exodus 12 and 1. And Yahweh spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. 13 and 4 of Exodus. This day came ye out in the month Abib. Thank you. So we see how, again, this gospel is revealing a truth that the world was, was not teaching us and could not teach us. And a lot of times they didn't even know they weren't teaching us. So this mystery of iniquity that is a part of our father's purpose, he has a mystery of righteousness, a mystery of Yahweh, and a mystery of iniquity. And so we have to understand he is in full control of both mysteries. And he shares that with us here in Egypt, how he set Egypt up to get his glory. He set that dynasty up and then had a prophet prophesy that the children of Israel will come down into Egypt or into a land they know nothing about and be evilly entreated. Now this tabernacle pattern as it's shared has a most holy place, holy place court round about. And it shows the unity. Let's get Deuteronomy 6 and 4 and Zechariah 14 and 9. It shows that our creator is a unity, our father is a unity, and that everything he created is a unity, and that he is with one name. Let's get that read. Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our Elohim, is Yahweh a unity? And Zechariah 14 and 9, please. Zechariah 14 and 9. And Yahweh shall be king over all the earth. And in that day, Yahweh were proved to be a unity and with one name. And as a, as a previous speaker mentioned, this name Yahweh is masculine and feminine. And she shared with us how we know this. Because we see when he creates the man Adam, Adam is masculine and feminine because we see in scripture how Eve is drawn out of Adam. But we understand since being in class that vowels are used to help pronounce a word. In Hebrew, there are no vowels written. These characters, or as it's shared in the moderation, you have characters or letters are the Hebrew characters and letters that's in everyone's Bible. You'll see it in Psalms 119. Recently, I was sharing with a, a, a person who will be coming to our class for the first time uh, this month, uh, who is a Jew. He, uh, we looked at a, a, a version of a Bible he was using, and interestingly enough, this character, which we know as Yod, it's, it's with a letter Y, but th that version is now putting it in the letter J. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to understand when you look up, take the time to look up this letter J. One, it was never in, it, it was never in anyone's language, not even the English language during the time the Messiah walked the earth plane. See when this letter J was created and functional in use, and you'll see that it could it was an impossibility for the Savior who walked the earth plane to be even called anything with the letter J. So it's really important to see that because the mystery of iniquity is truly at work. Okay, and he's doing his best to keep that, you know, keep the veil, you know, of the flesh from seeing the truth. And when I speak about a veil, it's it's because of this tabernacle pen that we were given. And it's constructed, as we said earlier, with a most holy place, a holy place in a court roundabout. This, vest, this tabernacle has vessels that we learn in this class that points to principle. Let's get John 5 and 7, please, and, and Isaiah, line upon line, precept upon precept. So we see this tabernacle points to the Messiah points to our Father being the Father, Word, and Holy Spirit, most holy place, holy place, and forth round about. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And in this tabernacle, there are vessels. 
that correlate to our physical body, man-made by the pattern. This chart's called Man Made in the Image of Elohim by the pattern of the tabernacle. That's how we can confirm when he says, I will make man in my image and my likeness. We see this pattern that he gave to Moses to build to see how he is operating by pattern. And that in this pattern, there are vessels. You have the brazen altar. Brazen mean highly polished brass, which is where that sacrifice or death takes place for the, for the sacrifice of those who transgressed the law with Israel who, when Israel transgressed in the wilderness of Sinai. You see a brazen labor, which means water. It has water in it, which points to a cleansing or a baptism. They had to cleanse themselves. They had to cleanse the sacrifice in here. And so that it points to a baptism or immersion. You see a cup of anointing oil, which is actually a horn, but we see this cup of anointing oil is at the door that anoints the priest to officiate into the holy place. In this holy place, you have a golden seven branch lampstand, a golden table of shoe bread, and a golden altar of incense. As you cross this door, you see a first veil. This first veil is really without angels on it. It is blue, purple, and scarlet, which is proven in scripture in the book of Exodus that it points to Yahshua, because all these vessels point to Yahshua's purpose. So the high, this high priest crosses the door, is anointed by, and, and the oil points to spirit, so you have blood, water, spirit, and then this holy place points to a principle of 40. It also points to light, bread, and intercession, but this principle of 40 will show in every event of scripture how we will see, just as with Noah, there are 40 days and 40 nights that that flood takes place. So we'll see after they uh, after the high priest takes you know is is um, performing his administration in in this holy place that there's a second veil which is blue purple and scarlet embroidered with angels. This second veil is is what separates the holy place from the most holy place. And once a year, the high priest is only allowed to come in here once a year, and and to perform his services for the forgiveness of himself and his family, the forgiveness of the people, and to cleanse the sanctuary. And here in this most holy place, you have a golden ark of the, of the covenant, a golden ark, and you'll see two archangels overshadowing the mercy seat. Inside this ark of the covenant, you'll see the Ten Commandments law, a cup of manna, and Aaron's rod that budded. So let's get that read in Isaiah and in um, John. 1 John 5 and 7, Isaiah 28, 9 and 10. 1 John 5 and 7, Holy Name Version. For there are three things that bear witness. Huh? Read that no, again, please. King James Version. King James Version. 1 King John James 5 and 7. Go ahead. But there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree in one. Thank you. And we have here on this chart called the chart on the pattern or plan of salvation, a chart that our founder laboriously in love had drawn out and painted, showing us again the threefold pattern of our savior being a most holy place, a holy place in the court round about, and showing the events of scripture from the transgression to the other side of the plate where we're seeing being read now, first John five, seven and eight, that mm -hmm. spoke, that speaks to witnesses, witnesses that build our faith in knowing that he is operating by a pattern and each event of scripture is pointing to him. Okay, we have Isaiah. Isaiah 28 and 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. Here a little and there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. Thank you. So that's fine. 
So we see when he says precept upon precept, didn't know what a precept was till coming to this class. And it is something that does not change. The blood that's operating in everyone present here in class and that will be listening is operating by a principle, which is called blood. We have water as well. That's a precept. And we know that we could not have any life without a spirit operating in us. And we have spirit, water, blood. Blood, water, spirit. It is a precept upon precept, line upon line. And these lines, if you draw the line from the bloodline all the way down through these plates, you'll see according to the pattern that every event is showing forth a death principle or blood. You'll see it all the way through where the Messiah himself fulfills it as that sacrifice where the blood is shown on, when he's nailed to his right hand, nailed to his left hand, nailed to his feet, and a crown of thorns on his head. Four points of blood. And we see it here when he's baptized by John, where he says, suffer it so to be now for it. Thus it becomes us, us to fulfill, which means put an end to these things that were instituted back under the law. And we see that the spirit, that dove this descended, you know, and declares him the Messiah. So we see blood, water, spirit, and we'll see that throughout these charts. So hopefully- Excuse me, Dr. Up. Pra, you asked for 12.15? Yes, I'm about to finish up, thank you. So as you can see, my time is up, but I hope something was said that you can take with you, first sure. time visitors, returning visit, and those who are gonna be called during Tuesdays to rehearse what Joshua has given us to share this gospel. You know, it's a, we're commanded to share this gospel because it, it, it's, it's what we need to do. And, and, and when, this, when he has called the last one, this age is closing. So it's very important. Our father has always said to us, you know, that it's important to hold fast to that which is good, to search, to research and prove that which is good and hold fast to it. So with those few words, I'd like to yield the floor. Um, praise Yahshua for anything that was said that has edified you. And we will begin the second reading in our school text in Elohim, the archetype original pattern. You want to start, Jackie? Go ahead, baby. I'm sorry. Let me, it's let me first, uh, let me, yes, let me first set this up, please. Page 22. It's still really small. Yes. Will you please <laughs> let me first set this up? Thank you. All right. On the day of Pentecost. So this is being read from Elohim, the archetype original pattern of the universe. This is volume two, entitled The Absolute Necessity of Universal Apostolic Confirmation in parentheses, not deacons. This is our second reading of this text. So that involves uh, pausing at various points to expound with the, with the members here in class, their knowledge of what Joshua shared with them for the audience. Readers. On the day of Pentecost, Peter rose up and said, these men are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith Yahweh. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, which means Jews and Gentiles. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Mm -hmm. Acts 2 and 15 through 17. Someone's going to read that. It was <laughs> quoted there. Uh -huh. Now, if the apostles and others who had been baptized by baptized with John's water baptism had received the Holy Spirit, and it was not necessary for them to be baptized with water again, why should it be necessary for Cornelius and his household or the Gentiles to be baptized with water? after Yahweh had given them the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Okay, before we continue, I'm looking at Acts 2. So let's read Acts 2, 15 through 17, because 
there's more to what was just written here about it. Acts 2.15, for these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith Yahweh, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Thank you. Okay. Does anyone have any comment on this paragraph that they would like to share? Okay, Rita, let's move to the next paragraph. She didn't finish this one, did she? Oh, she didn't? No. Oh, I apologize. It's, okay. It's all right. To look at the question from the other side. <clears throat> that is, it was necessary according to the purpose of Yahweh for the Jews, for the Gentiles to be baptized with water. Why did not Elohim send John the Baptist to baptize them when he was carrying out his mission, then Peter would not have had to ask them that went with him from Joppa to Caesarea if they could forbid the Gentiles to be baptized with water. According to Luke's testimony in Acts of the Apostles, Peter, having learned his lesson in Caesarea, never forgot thereafter that Yahweh did not intend that the Gentiles should be baptized with water. But he, Yahshua, through the Holy Spirit, did and would continue to graft the Gentiles being circumcised and well, keeping, excuse me, the Gentiles, Gentiles the church. to the church of the, to the church, excuse me, the church. body of the Messiah mm -hmm. by faith. Mm -hmm. Or when the second controversy arose about the Gentiles being circumcised and keeping the law of Moses in AD 52, the apostles and elders being present in Jerusalem were to consider this matter. Peter rose up in the council and said unto them, men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago, AD 41, Yahweh made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And Yahweh, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Spirit, even as he did unto us on the day of Pentecost, mm -hmm. Acts 2 and 4. And putting no difference between us that had been circumcised and baptized with water, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why tempt ye Yahweh to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Mm -hmm. Acts 15, 6 through 10. This pleased all of the apostles and elders with the whole church and the Holy Spirit also, Acts 15, 20 through 29, for further proof and harmony among the apostles on this issue. See, apostolic, epistle, epistle no, epistle, epistemological summary. Right. So this paragraph has a, a very important point that I hope to a member can go over when it comes to the institution and fulfillment of water baptism. The floor is open. Is there a member that would like to share what Joshua has given them regarding the institution and fulfillment of water baptism? Okay, let's get the chart. And let's look I, at. Sorry, I had a hard time because I'm on my phone today because I'm working, but I'd like to do it um, briefly. Uh, 
So I don't have anything with me. I don't have my books or anything. But if you get me the Moses chart, please. Mm -hmm. And then I want maybe a couple, three verses. First, let's start with John 3, or is it, no, Matthew 3, 13, please. And then I'd also like to get um, 1 Corinthians 10 and 1, 1 through 4. First, did you want okay. me to start Matthew 3, 13? Mm -hmm. Please. Then cometh Yahshua from Galilee to Jordan unto John mm -hmm. to be baptized of him. For John forbade him saying a little bit because I like to have somebody really understand what it is that we're reading. So Yahshua is coming to John to be baptized, physically water baptized. And he's going to give them the reason why he's being baptized. So we want to always be careful when we read that we read all the words and, and understand what it is that we're reading. All right, keep reading. Thank you. <laughs> Verse 14. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? Okay, so now why would he say that to him? Why would John say that? Well, John, you'll find out if you read through, uh, I think it's the first chapter of Matthew, or maybe, I don't know, the first books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John talk about Yahshua and his baptism and his birth and all that stuff. So anyway, what you have here is John was told to go and baptize the Jews, the baptism of remission of sin. And so they came to John to be baptized or have their sins, you know, in a symbol. And it was a symbol back then uh, to be baptized and have their sins be in remission through Yahshua the Messiah. But it was really through, if you look at the way that John did it, he was baptizing in physical, natural water. And they were coming to him and John would say, have you sinned? And they would say, yes, I, I've sinned. I'm a sinner. And that's why I want to go through this for the remission of sin. And then when he comes to Yahshua, Yahshua, he's saying, have you sinned? And Yahshua is saying, no, I, have, I, I don't have any sin. And you always want to remember that, you know, Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim and Yahshua are one. There's mm -hmm. no sin in them, you know. And, and there's a whole explanation of it, but sometime we'll talk about that. But anyway, I'll stick with baptism. So anyway, let's go back to the reading, please. So he's saying, you, I should be baptized of you. And you're coming to me to be baptized? See, read. Verse 15. And Yahshua said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. Right. So thus it becometh us to fulfill. Mm -hmm. Now the word fulfill means to bring into completeness or bring to an end. Fulfill. A simple example of it is if you fulfill a car payment, if you're making a car payment and you make $230 every month for 36 months. All right. Mm -hmm. you, you do that every month when it's finished. When you finish paying it, it's fulfilled and you're done with it. That's the end of it. All right. That's just a simple example. There's lots more examples about fulfillment. But this is what Yahshua says he's doing when he's being physically water baptized. He's fulfilling or bringing physical water baptism to an end. All right. And this is what he was doing for those three and a half years, actually for the whole 33 years, but those three and a half years of his ministry, he's fulfilling fulfilling and he says over 40 times in matthew mark luke and john that he's fulfilling something in the law and the testimony all right so let's go to um first corinthians first corinthians 10 and 1 moreover brethren i would not that ye should be ignorant how okay talking to him listen this is paul talking and it's after the, he's received the holy spirit and he's saying i don't want you to be ignorant of this brethren Right. And his were the Jews, you understand, at that time. That's who he's talking to. Keep mm -hmm. reading. How that all our fathers were under the cloud and all now, passed. Listen, all our fathers. Who's he talking about, the fathers? Well, if you look right here on Moses' chart, you've got, they were down in Egypt. That's that black part. Then you have the wilderness of Sinai. That's the middle part. And then you have 
uh, Canaan's land. That's the most holy place. Goes by the tabernacle pattern. Most holy place, Canaan land. Holy place, wilderness of Sinai. Court roundabout is the Egypt in this particular pattern. Okay. Now keep reading. How all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And okay, so all fathers were down in Egypt, and Yahweh had sent Moses down there with the name of Yahweh to bring them up out of Egypt. And so right there is what he's talking about. All our fathers were in the cloud and under in, in the sea and under the cloud, in or in whatever it says. We'll have to read it again because I might get mixed up. <laughs> we're under the cloud and I'll pass through the sea. And so they were all under the cloud and they all passed through the sea and they were all baptized right there. Right, right unto there. Moses in the cloud baptized. and in the sea. That's right. That's right. They were baptized in the cloud and in the sea. So right there is where the uh, a baptism took place. And that wasn't really even the first baptism. If you look on this chart and you see that first circle, that's the earth inundated in water. So the mm -hmm. whole earth is physically water baptized. And everything that was in it. And you know what? You were in there also. But that whole earth plane was inundated in water. And then you come to the next circle and you have Noah's Ark. And at the end of that second age, the, the, the first age in time, you have Noah and the people that were in the ark. They were inundated in water. The fountains of the deep broke up. And then it was raining from above. They were inundated in water. So that was like it were a baptism. They were surrounded or immersed in water. You understand physical water and then you have it with the children of israel right and then you have all through you know in the in the temple at the time of david in the temple when the temple was read solomon in the temple there was many labors for washings and baptisms and in the priesthood under the law the priesthood was told to wash and and be cleansed at the labors all right so that's a point of baptism so you have baptism through the law and the testimony you understand and then yahshua comes in and fulfills physical water baptism so that if if something and you know if he said it's the end and when he got up on the cross one of the things he said it is finished and he wasn't talking about just his natural physical life was finished he was talking about the purpose that he came in was to fulfill the law and the testimony and confirm the things that were written in the law and in the testimony by the holy spirit were the self same things that he comes in to fulfill so you know that he is the savior and i don't know about you but nobody ever pointed the savior out to me back in the law and testimony before i came into this teaching you understand? It has to come through a vision and revelation. The founder is the one that brought these things out and told us about physical water baptism. And it was not in this age. Okay, take me to the ages chart. I can't see it very good because it's on my phone. It's pretty small, but that, I'll just try it. Okay, so you see the cross right there. Everything mm -hmm. that happened before then was natural, physical, earthly, and temporary way of worshiping your creator. The law was temporary. The physical, natural ordinances, such as baptism, suppers, ten commandments, all that was temporary. And when Yahshua goes through his death, burial, and resurrection and pours out the Holy Spirit, there's not, and, and we're supposed to be, John 4 and 24 says that Yahweh is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And I believe it's the 23rd chapter. Let's go ahead and read John 4, 23 and 24. John 4, 23. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. What? The Father seeketh such to worship him. Those that will worship him in spirit and in truth. And physical water baptism is not spirit. And it really, uh, after Yahshua goes through his death, burial, and resurrection and finishes it, it's not truth. It's not truth about how you should worship him. So you're, if you're doing it physically, anything you think you're doing physically so, as far as worshiping, trying to do something physical, you are not worshiping the Father in spirit and truth. And I don't mean to say there's nothing to do. You understand, you, we do have a responsibility to preach this gospel till the end of the age and to study and to learn and to know and understand these things. That's your responsibility right now. 
But as far as a physical way of worship, Yahshua came in and finished them and he moved them out of the way when he was physically water baptized. Okay, I want one more verse. Uh, 1 Corinthians. Uh, I didn't read 24. Yahweh is spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So well, that's how he must be worshiped in spirit and truth. And that, this is Joshua talking. Now, I think he knows just about what he's talking about. And that's another thing. We need to always think about the way he says things, who he says it to, and and the things that he says. He knows the, you know, it's not like just talking to a regular Joe Schmo from Idaho, <laughs> or whatever you're talking about. You see, it's not just talking to somebody. He knows the Father's purpose. He's always got it on his mind. He's teaching and telling them the things that are going to be. The Father seeketh such to worship in spirit and truth. For Yahweh, he is spirit. And you keep coming back to class if you're just with us for a short time. And we can show you how he is substance and how that substance takes on shape and form. And that self-same substance that Yahweh's spirit is, he gives to you when he gives you the Holy Spirit. And that's what this is all about. You receiving the Holy Spirit through the great teaching that he's delivered unto us. All right, go to 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. 1 Corinthians 12 and 13. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. By one spirit, not by physical water. And this is Paul right at the beginning of the self-same age that we're in right now. He's talking about how you are baptized or immersed right now. It's not physical. By one spirit, we are all immersed into one body. What body is that? It's the body of Yahshua the Messiah. It's his resurrected body. He went through a death, burial, resurrection, poured out that Holy Spirit, and he's brought you or gathered you back in through the preaching of the gospel. But go ahead and start that again. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. By one great spirit are we all baptized into one body. That's how we're immersed in that body. By that one spirit, we're immersed. So we're immersed in spirit. And it's not a mystical thing. You think about coming to class, and it, it's as simple as every time you come to class and have a seat, every time you come to a Zoom class, we're going to talk about the names of Yahweh, Elohim, and Yahshua. So you're immersed in the name. You, we're going to hear, you're going to hear that Yahshua came in through witnesses of the law and the testimony. And that he came in and fulfilled what was written about him in the law and the testimony. You're immersed in that truth about him. You understand that? And you're going to be immersed that the great thing that he did when he went through a death, a burial, and a resurrection. And then he, further than that, he goes through that death, burial, resurrection. And 50 days later, he pours out the Holy Spirit on the Jews. And then seven years later on the Gentiles. And all through this age, the Holy Spirit has been poured out. You understand? And it's still being poured out. And we're right down to the end right now where Yahshua is going to be revealed universally so. And if you're still doing physical water baptism, you are not worshiping in spirit and truth. You understand? And there's a lot more to it, but I hope somebody got something out of that. Praise Joshua. Hallelujah. Praise Hallelujah. Hey, okay, reader. According to Luke's testimony in the Acts of the Apostles, Peter, having learned his lesson in Caesarea, never forgot thereafter that Yahweh did not intend that the Gentiles should be baptized with water. But he, Yahshua, through the Holy Spirit, did and would continue to graft the Gentiles into the church or body of the Messiah by faith. For when the second controversy arose about the Gentiles being circumcised and keeping the law of Moses in AD 52, the apostles and elders being present in Jerusalem were to consider this matter. Peter rose up in the council and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that, it, that a good while ago, A.D. 41, Yahweh made choice among us that the Gentiles by mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. 
and Yahweh, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Spirit, even as he did unto us on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2 and 4, and putting no difference between us that had been crucified circumcised and baptized with water, purified their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why tempt ye Yahweh to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we are able to bear? Acts 15, 6 through 10. This pleased all of the apostles and elders with the whole church and the Holy Spirit also. Acts 15, 20 through to 29, for further proof and harmony among the apostles on this issue. See apostolic epistological summary. Apollo preached. I beg your pardon? I said, did we want to get the scriptures that was talked about in that paragraph? No, we just went over them. Here in the paragraphs, let's go to C. C. Apollos preached in the synagogue at Ephesus in AD 55 or 56. Luke said Apollos, being a Jew from Alexandria, Egypt, was mighty in the scriptures, but did not know other than John's water baptism of repentance at that time, Acts 18 24, that to say, that he did not understand or know about Yahshua baptizing with the Holy Spirit, which was spoken of by John the Baptist himself, Matthew 3 and 11. The baptism of the Holy Spirit did begin to take place on the day of Pentecost and was continued up until this present time. For Yahshua, in the days of his flesh, was the personification of the Holy Spirit, John 7, 39, John 16 and 7. Let's get those two verses, please. John 7, 39 and John 16 and 7. John 7 and 39. But this spake he of the spirit, which they that believed on him should receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Yahshua was not yet glorified. And John 16 and 7. Never, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Thank you. Let's continue reading. Neither, neither, had had, mm -hmm. neither had Apollos heard anything about the present dispensational so-called Christian baptism. Aquila and Priscilla, a man and his wife, after hearing Apollos preach to the congregation, descended, discerned, discerned that he did did not know the present dispensational truth about Yahshua and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Aquila and Priscilla took Apollos unto themselves and taught or expounded unto him according to the scriptures of the gospel or the power of Yahweh, Romans 1 and 16, in a more clear and perfect way. That is That's, to say, did I'm you want sorry. to yeah, let's read that, Romans 1 and 16, please. Romans 1, 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of the Messiah, for it is the power of Yahweh unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Thank you. Let's continue reading. In a more clear and perfect way, that is to say, Aquila and Priscilla explained to Apollos that Yahshua had been crucified, buried, and that Yahweh had raised him from the dead. And he had ascended into heaven according to the scriptures. 
Yahshua the Messiah was now preaching him, Elohim, through the apostles, baptizing with the Holy Spirit, as John the Baptist in Matthew 3 and 11 had said he would do, Acts 18 and 24 through 28. Let's get Matthew 3 and 11, please, and Acts 18, 24. Matthew 3 and 11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Acts 18 and 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and a mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of Yahweh, and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of Yahweh, knowing only the baptism of John. And he been, began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took, took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of Yahweh more perfectly, 27. And when he was disposed to pass into Archaea, the brethren wrote exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them which, excuse me, helped them much, which had believed through grace, 28. For he mightily convinced the Jews and that publicly showing by the scriptures that Yahshua was the Messiah. Thank you. In, we... Acts, mm -hmm. in Acts 19 and one through seven, Luke says, and it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, in AD 58, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. He, Paul, said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Spirit since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard, neither there be any Holy right. Spirit, whether there be any Holy Spirit, excuse me. And he said unto them, unto what then are we baptized? Mm -hmm. And they said, unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John, verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying, baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him. Mm -hmm. That is on Yahshua the Messiah, which they heard Excuse me, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of Yahshua, not water. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came up, up came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied, and all the men were about 12. Yeah, I just want to add a comment here so that we understand when Paul laid his hands upon them, Again, this is seen in fulfillment when we read earlier that when Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel were gathered on the mount, and Yahweh Elohim, if I can get my computer to, get my computer to bring up the chart. Okay. We'll see here that Yahweh Elohim did not lay his hands upon them. Mm -hmm. Which means that they were they did not understand mm -hmm. the vision of Elohim that was shown to them. So we see here in fulfillment that Paul, being an apostle, an eyewitness, that's written here that Dr. Kennedy is showing us, is that by 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 making us by preaching the gospel to to their understanding, it it it, it the Holy Spirit then fills them. And so, and, and they're able to, to understand as well. So it's really important to preach this gospel with understanding because that's what Yahshua, you know, does for us 
as a comforter is to help us, is to comfort us in keeping us in his light, which involves understanding. It is, is a knowledge, a divine knowledge, not a carnal knowledge of his purpose, pattern, and plan. Okay, let's keep reading because we're, we're running out of time. Interpretation of Luke's statement in the above paragraph, many the theologians believe that Paul rebaptized with the so-called Christian water baptism. Those whom, those whom he found at Ephesus that had been baptized with John's water baptism of repentance and that Paul in so doing gave them to understand that he was obeying the great commission by baptizing them again in water in the name of Yahshua the Messiah. However, this cannot be so. Why? Because in the true sense of the word Christian, no one is considered to be a Christian, excuse me, no one is considered to be a Christian before he has received the Holy Spirit. And Paul certainly did not baptize them again the third time in the name of Yahshua after they had received the Holy Spirit. It is also to be remembered that in the city of Ephesus, where idolatrous people dwell in Asia, Revelations 2, 1 through 8, is the place where Apollos had preached in the synagogues the things of the Messiah, knowing only the baptism of John to be a mixed and divided congregation of Jews and Gentiles, believers and unbelievers, or to those that believed in being circumcised and keeping the law of Moses, those that believed in Yahshua, the Yahshua and those Gentiles that believed in the idol goddess Diana. Acts 19, 35. The apostle Paul and the elders had quite a serious problem in that city trying to reconcile the unbelievers unto Yahweh by preaching the gospel of Yahshua to them, Acts 19, 24 through 28, and compare with Revelations 2, 1 through 8. So let's get Revelations 2, 1 through 8. One reader can get that. Revelations chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. And the other reader can get for us Acts 19, 24 through 28. And let's look at the two. Revelations 2 and 1. Unto the angel of the assembly of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlestick. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hath borne, and hath patience, and for my name's sake has labored, and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou, <clears throat> but this thou hast, that thou hated the deeds of the Nickelodeons, 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 Nickelodeons. Okay, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the assemblies. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of Yahweh. Eighth verse. And unto the angel of the assembly of Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, 
which was dead and is alive. Did you want uh, Acts 19, 1 through 7? Is that the next one? Acts 19, 24 through 28. Acts 19, 24 through 28. Okay. For Acts 19 and 24. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation and said, Sirs, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth. Moreover, ye see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, that Paul hath persuaded and turned again, excuse me, turned away much people, saying that they be no gods, which no Elohim, which are made with hands. So that not only this, our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also, excuse me, but also that the temple of the goddess Diana should be despised, despised and her magnification should be destroyed, whom also Asia and the world worship. And when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of, of the Ephesians. Mm. Okay, so if we can just read one more time, Revelations 2, 1 through 8, keeping in mind what we just read here, what the warning is in Revelations that applies today. Revelations chapter 2, verse 1 through 8. We've got five minutes, Doc. Thank you. Unto the angel of the assembly of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and has found them liars, and has borne and hath patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy lampstand out of his place except by repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolotans, which I also, which I also hate. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Jackie. Mm -hmm. He seventh verse. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the assembly. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of Yahweh. Eighth verse. And unto the angel of the assembly of the Samaritan write. These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Reader can read the last paragraph. This concludes our direct comment on some of the things that Luke was endeavoring to convey to His Excellency, His Excellency Theophilus by writing the defensive document, better known to us as the Acts of the Apostles. For this reason, we will start our epistemological summary, excusing the explanatory note with Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. 
So we have run out of time, but I thank Yashua for allowing us to finish the second reading and hopefully to encourage everyone in attendance and viewing to, to do some research, to investigate these things, to review the scripture references that was discussed, and to, to hopefully be uh, ready to attend the next class uh, so that our understanding can be further increased by the things that was said today. With all praises to Yahshua and Messiah, to now turn the uh, class over to the moderator. Hallelujah. 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 We thank everyone that came out to study with us today. We hold classes Tuesday through Friday, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, 2 a.m. I'm sorry, 12 a.m. to 2 a.m. in Malaysia, and 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. in England. Our class for our Jamaican brethren is Sundays at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. May we all stand in our hearts and minds for the doxology, which is taken from the last two verses of the book of Jude. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise Elohim, our Savior, to Yahshua the Messiah, our Sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time, now and ever. Let us all say together, Hallelujah. 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 Excuse me. God bless your day. Hallelujah.